Once over again, schönen Nachmittag, guten Morgen, guten Abend, welcome everybody. I always forget to unmute myself, but you are very attentive. So today we will do mostly computations, but the computations are kind of fun and surprising. So <clears throat> of course, if I just give you the end result and the formula, you will believe it. But if you do the computation, you will see that it's really coming out and you live it more uh, intensively that there's really something funny happening. And uh, before doing so, let me refresh what we did last time. So let me recall. Uh, we did uh, the normal form of differential operators uh, in one variable but just for one local exponent, so we had L, the differential operator, with holomorphic coefficients. The order of L was n, then L0 was the initial form of L at 0. We are working always locally, rho in omega was a local exponent. So I usually denote by omega, this should be an omega. <laughs> I denote the local exponents. And uh, we assume that it is maximal. Assumed to be maximal with respect to z, rho plus k not in omega for all k least one. So in this situation, we could characterize at least one solution of Ly equals 0. So we define the function space, define f, and that's the easiest case, x rho times o. So I take it here convergent, but you could also think of it as formal power series. And uh, let L act on F, OK? So the key observation is to look what L0 does on this one. Then L0, how do I want to write it? x rho is 0, because rho is a, rho is a root of the additional polynomial. So <clears throat> this recall, this would be chi of rho times x to the rho, where we assume that the shift of L0 is 0 to simplify our life. So we have this solution, is a solution. And as rho is maximal, We can determine the image of L0. So L0 of f, we already showed this, was just x times f, which is x to the rho plus 1 times o. You remember, I hope. So based on this and writing L as L0 minus t, T now an operator del of shift <clears throat> at least one, T of F will lie inside X times F. And then we get setting U identity on F minus S composed with T, where so I abbreviate a little bit. S was the inverse <coughs> of L0 taken on the direct complement of its kernel, where kernel L0 direct sum H is F, and L0 restricted to H from H to x times f is an isomorphism. 
Okay, this will be our standard situation. And then this u normalizes L to L0, then L composed with u inverse, I prefer to write it like this, L0 on F. So this is not, not an abstract equality here inside the ring of differential operators, but this means now the, oper the linear maps, linear maps on F. And there you can compose this U, okay? <clears throat> this was the normal form theorem in this case. And uh, we noticed that we need, in order to have this convergence, so the convergence, which means to work here in this one, remember we had f hat, x rho, o hat, the formal case, the convergence of staying inside your O, which means that this U maps convergent power series to convergent power series, requires that the order of L0 as an operator is the order of L. And this is just 0 is a regular Singularity. Can you still read here? I am sorry. Okay. And as a consequence or corollary, we can solve at least for one solution Ly equals zero as solution. y1 equals u inverse x rho. And this will be now, as u maps holomorphic functions to holomorphic functions, this will be some h of x, h in u. And by the special shape of u, we will get that h0 is non-zero. So this has a constant term. So the order, if you want, the order of this x rho times h of x is precisely x to 0. OK? Non-zero constant term. Now, you may complain and say, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm cheating because I put everything in this h here, and we don't know what h is. And you are right. Uh, there is no explicit formula for h. There is just an algorithm, an infinite algorithm, to compute h. But of course, you get various properties on h. So one thing where we want to go, and which is not covered here, is that we may want to know that h is an algebraic power series. So this is not given by this normal form theorem here. So this here, this is NFT. In the simplest case, no? and uh, maybe we put it as a question. What else do we need to confirm special properties of H of X? There we just have a machine producing the coefficients of h, but we may want to have more knowledge about h, more information about h. For instance, integer coefficients. Or algebraicity. One thing which we get out of here is the radius of convergence. Radius of convergence. We don't get it exactly, but at least we get an estimate. It must be at least 
such and such. Okay. And moreover, uh, this result will give us a kind of systematic way to produce more solutions. Okay. So that's what we did last time. Any questions so far to this uh, uh, last uh, class from last week? Just uh, raise your hand or speak it out if you want to know something. Now today, now with this result here, we just have one solution. No? And we want to know more. So now we take, assume that rho in omega is not just uh, a simple root, but is a multiple root. Is a multiple root of chi. So in the statement before, I did not assume anything about the multiplicity of rho here. But I just got one solution. But if rho has a multiplicity larger than 1, I want to get more solutions. No? Assume that rho is a multiple root of chi of multiplicity m equals m rho, let's say at least 2. Then we want to determine further solution. <coughs> want to find, to construct further solutions. Actually, precisely m ones. M of an <coughs> and of course, as we know already, they will involve logarithms, involving logarithms. And recall that L0, y equals 0, will have solutions x rho, x rho log x, and so on, up to x rho log x to the power m minus 1. We are going to reprove this today by kind of different means. So two things we want to do. First, we want to, this what we know already, we want to prove it in a nice way, introducing new variables. And then we want to extend this normal form theorem to a more general space. Now here, in this space here, we have no logarithm. No? So the idea is, introduce a variable, a new variable z for log x. Of course, as I said already last time, you could equally work with the logarithm directly, but this just makes everything uh, more complicated and does not provide any more input. The only thing we need is that <coughs> log x is a primitive of 1 over x. OK? So I, I hope you have all this in mind, and I can erase everything and continue from scratch. So. One thing I, I would like to show you today is that if you, if you put your objects in the right setting, then things become very nice in the sense that they become almost natural. So <clears throat> before I start with uh, our Z, let me refresh or recall what is understood by Frobenius method, or for the trick of Frobenius. The trick 
of Frobenius which does not appear in the work of Fuchs. Fuchs was the one who proved and developed the theory at, at first. But Frobenius modified a little bit the argument, and he did it in the following way. Let E be an Euler operator of shift 0. Let rho be a local exponent of multiplicity at least 2. Let's restrict to this case. So we know that chi of rho is 0, but we also know that chi prime of rho is 0. And if it is exactly 2, then it would be, would fi be finished. But here we have chi m minus 1 of rho is 0, where m is m rho. Furthermore, we know, because E is Euler, we know that E of x to the t is chi of t. Now t is here an arbitrary variable, x to the t. So of course, <coughs> if you plug in rho, you get 0. E x rho is 0. Now the idea of the, the trick of Frobenius, and if you look at his paper, it is kind of hidden, but it, you can make it explicit. You differentiate this equation with respect to t differentiate e x t equal chi t x t with respect to t. Okay. Now, as I think I already told you, Frobenius does not talk of t as a variable. He takes it as a constant, but a constant moving in the complex plane on a circle. So it is. it plays the role of a variable, but he does not dare to call it like this. Yeah? So he calls it, I think, varying point or something like this. No? So now, if you differentiate, you just do it on both sides. Let me do it slowly, because it's really nice. So we get dt e x t equal dt chi t x t. And as E does not involve T, this is the same as E dt xt equal. And here we get chi prime of T xt by product rule plus chi t. And here we get T xt minus 1. Okay. And uh, sorry, that's not. Uh, that's, of course, completely nonsense. As you have noticed, that's not what I want to write here. I'm not differentiating with respect to x. I'm differentiating with respect to t. So we get dt xt. Now, if you, if you plug in t equals rho, Then we get E of, so I first have to differentiate xt and then have to set t equals rho. But chi of rho is 0, chi prime of rho is 0, so we get 0. But this one here, as t does not appear in E, this is E of dt xt evaluated at t equals rho. So we are left to compute what is dt xt, uh, but dt xt is dt, you write it, I think at the beginning or in the trailer, I already did this computation. This is nothing else than x of t times the log of x. So we get inner derivative 
log of x, exp, so <coughs> x to the t. And hence, we see that this here is nothing else than E of x rho log x. And then you can iterate. Now, of course, you can say, well, that's trivial. But you have to see it. I mean, you have to think of differentiating your equation with respect to the exponent. And now this trick appears over and over again in the literature. So uh, what we are doing is just the beginning of the iceberg because we are in one variable, we are in the continuous setting, you can do it in the discrete setting, you can do it in several variables, you can do it for uh, <coughs> d modules uh, in combinatorics over and over again. Okay, now here, the same trick works if you have higher multiplicity. So this already proves that we get all these solutions. Now, <clears throat> let me write here etc up to m minus 1 just to complete. So this suggests, and we will do it, to extend our function space. Enlargement of the function space which I denoted by F. Now we have to find a small, it should be small, but allow for powers of logarithms. So in the classical literature, often the space where you are searching your solutions is not specified. Yeah? The authors speak about solving equations, but often they don't say where they solve the equations. So we put a special focus on specifying where we look for our equations. So now we define new definition. And it will not be the last one, but for the moment, we take, we keep again our rho. We take O and we add Z. Actually, this is a little bit too large, as we will see in a moment, but for the for the start, this is OK. Now, with, we have to look this as a differential ring with d bar derivation. I did this already, defined by d bar of x equals 1, d bar of z equal to x minus 1. 1 over x. So now we have several things. We have three types of derivations. Note, I will need all three. We have del acting on f, not looking at z, uh, ignoring Z. So this del would be just differentiation with respect to x. Then we have our del bar as just defined. But then we can also take the usual derivative with respect to z, and I will write it dz. This is the usual derivative with respect to z. We will need all three. I hope the notation is clear. So this underlined del is a big one, acting on x and z in a non-trivial way. Okay. So accordingly,
if we take L in ord L, we get extensions L underline for the action of L on X row on X uh, X row O Z using now del underline. So <coughs> if L is some I am not sure how I call them, maybe AI del I, then L bar is just some AI del bar I underline. Okay, AI, you know. I hope everything is clear. So we get this L underline, and we want to know what it does. So let me first think of an oil operator. Now this is a key lemma for today. I mentioned it already last time, but today I want to prove it because the proof is nice. Let E in O del be Euler shift zero with extension L under, E underline. I often write L zero instead of E, but then E. Now let's see what it does on Z, X, K, Z, I. So I need the initial polynomial, as usual, initial polynomial will be denoted by chi. So this can be computed. It's not completely obvious, but not very difficult either. You keep x to the k, and then you get the following. This was already indicated in the trick of Frobenius. You get chi of k, you keep zi, plus now you get the derivative of chi, k, and now here you get the derivative of i the usual, i zi minus 1, plus 1 over 2 factorial, which is 2, second derivative of chi, k, i times i minus 1, which is the second derivative of z to the i, z i minus 2, plus, and the last one is 1 over n factorial, n recall, the order of e will be n, so we go up to n. So maybe I should write this somewhere, order of e equals n. So we take the n, chi is a polynomial of degree n, so we can differentiate it n times of k. And then we get here i n falling factorial z i minus n. Now, one thing you should observe here is that if i is less than n, these last terms will disappear because this will be 0 for i less than n. So here you only go up to a certain degree and then you stop yeah, because uh, the, different, the derivative of z to the i will vanish if you do it sufficiently many times. Okay, so that's a formula which is very useful and which we will use in the sequel. I'm not going to prove it right now. We will prove it at the end of the class today because I want to first profit of the formula and show you how we can work with it. 
So we get immediately a second uh, as a corollary, but I formulate it again as a lemma, lemma two. Now if we take L an arbitrary operator, L in OD, so we don't allow Z in the operator of order N, then we get a kind of Taylor expansion of L underline, then L underline is L plus, now I have to take a little bit of care, I write L prime dz plus one over two factorial if you want, double prime dz square up to one over n factorial n's derivative of L d z n. Now, I have to define this differentiation of the differential operator where L prime and so on up to Ln act on F leaving Z invariant. So they only act on O and X rho and are defined as, now we just profit of this formula here, the derivative of a differential operator, it, it suffices by linearity to tell you what the del, the derivative of del is, so del j, so the j's derivative on x, and I differentiated L times. Now this acts on monomials xt, and this is defined. So what do you do? You <coughs> take the usual j's derivative, but then you get a chi, you get a, sorry, you get a, I write it down. So you get T J falling factorial as a coefficient if you would not have this L here, X to the T minus J. But what you do is you differentiate this coefficient L times. Okay, so this is a derivative, the else derivative with respect to t. This is a kind of a strange object, but it turns out it is not as strange as it looks like. It, it is a fantastic object because it has satisfies many nice properties, okay? We call this the else derivative of our differential operator. And then accordingly, you get it on for capital L, okay? Let us practice a little bit with this differentiation. Uh, of course, it's just a reformulation of what Frobenius did, but it makes things more explicit, and I think it, it makes them also more beautiful because you see precisely what's going on. So let us compute a little bit with these <clears throat> derivatives of differential operators. What's the time? Oh yeah, we still have a, a bit of time until the break. So let me do some examples. Actually, you, do, you should do this on your own because it's, it's really fun. <clears throat> So let's start with the simplest case, j equals one. So we have del of xt is t times xt minus one, and del prime of xt 
is just 1 times xt minus 1, xt minus 1. You agree? And if you go further, del 2 and so on are all 0. L of xt is 0 for all L starting at 2. Now b, j equals 2. So we get del square xt, because this is a trivial computation, but we do it, t times t minus 1 xt minus 2. And if it now take del 2 prime of xt, we get, this is t squared minus t here, so we get 2t minus 1 times xt minus 2. Second derivative, del 2 double prime xt equal 2 times xt minus 2 and del 2, 3 of xt is 0, and so on. All further are 0. I do a last one, even though it's maybe not so fascinating. Let us do c j equals 3. Let's practice a little bit. Then we get del 3 prime of xt uh, will give you 3t squared minus 6t plus 2, if I'm not mistaken, xt minus 3. And then you derive again, sorry, del 3 double prime xt is 6t minus 6 xt minus 3, and so on. 3 double prime xt is 6 xt minus 3, and del 3 L of xt is 0 for all L starting at 4. So you get a little bit of feeling. Uh, it's a new kind of operation, but not very deep. But it turns out to be very useful. OK. So <clears throat> let me now return to our differential equations and recall on our differential operators and recall that our goal will be not only to, to find the normal form theorem, but the, the key point in the proof was to determine the image of the initial form operator. And let me do this here now. So let us do. Uh, Images of Euler operator to get a feeling what's going on. But now the Euler operators will act acting on x row O, including logarithms. So we take, I, have, I think I have two examples. After what we'll do it in all generality. So let me take E equal bum, 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 x square del square minus 3x del plus 3 Euler. Chi of t is t plus 1 square. So we have rho equals minus 1 a double root. m rho equals 2, multiplicity 2. And we take e bar the extension to our space f as before. So we have to compute just the image of a monomial. e bar of x to the k, z to the i. So this is now precisely following the formula from before, but I make it explicit. So here we get k plus 1 square zi plus derivative of k plus 1 square is 2k plus 1 
the x to the k is already in front of it. So here we get the derivative of that is i z i minus 1 plus 2 times, this is the next derivative, i i minus 1 z i minus 2. And we need not go further. Uh, that's already everything. So <clears throat> this will show us what we get in the image. And we see now that's no longer a monomial. No? Not a monomial. This will play a role. But nevertheless, we have a leading monomial, which is xkzi here. And then we have monomials of smaller degree. Okay. So at least the kernel, we can determine it, the kernel of E underline, quite clear. Uh, we can take k equals minus 1. But then this one will vanish. But if you take k minus 1, this one will not vanish. Is everything OK here? Yeah. Up, 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 up. Let me write it down. So this is C x inverse direct sum C x minus 1 z. Something is strange. So if you take k minus 1 without z, then this one will vanish and this one as well because you have uh, i uh, equals 0. And for this one, for this one, I think I have a Something is irritating me. If you take here k minus 1, this one will survive. So maybe I made a mistake here. This is t plus 1 square. Give me, give me a bit of time. I clarify it in the break. Uh, so something is, is, is kind of strange here. So this will lie inside x minus 1 o z. Yeah, I think it's just a computational error, but uh, I don't want to fix it uh, from scratch. So the second example is more interesting. We take degree order 3. We take x3 del 3 minus 4x square del square. Where am I? Plus 9x tel del minus 9. This is now order 3, chi of t is t minus 1, t minus 3 squared. So now we have two local exponents. Rho will be 3, m rho equal 2 of multiplicity 2. And I call it the smaller one, I call it sigma, is 1, m sigma equals 1 of multiplicity 1. Now, I'm not sure if I can squeeze my formula here, but let me do it. So we take E underline xkzi. You should verify this on your own. Again, we get x to the k as usual. And now we get, here we get the derivative of chi, which is k minus 1, k minus 3 square zi. That's OK. Then we get. 3k minus 5, now k minus 3 just without square, multiplied by i z i minus 1, and then plus. So it, this here is the derivative of this one. So this is why the k minus 3 survives. And then we get 6k minus 14 i i minus 1, z i minus 2. And the last one is just 6 times i 
i minus 1, i minus 2, z i minus 3. But I forgot to divide here by 2, 1 over 2, and 1 over 6, which is coming from the factorials. Okay. So now here, what do we see? We can write the kernel. Let me just write it here. The kernel of E, underline, will be, of course, we get uh, x alone, cx plus dial sum cx cubed. We, if you have no z at all, then it's OK. And then you get one z, which is due to the multiplicity 2 of 3 of the exponent here, cx3z. So let us check that this is correct. Yes, because when you plug in k equals 1 and i equals 0, then you just get this one and it will vanish. The other ones are automatically 0. And if you take k equals 3 and z equals 0, the same happens. And if you take k equals 3 and i equals 1, this one will survive, will be 0. This one will be 0 because k is 3. And this one will be 0 because i is 1, and this one as well. So this is the kernel. Okay. So I, maybe you can clarify example number one, where is the mistake. In any case, we, do, we make a five minutes break. And then we will back again. See you then. <clears throat> OK. As you probably noticed, the error was quite stupid. This 2k plus 1 is not the derivative. It is, of course, 2 times k plus 1. So <clears throat> this one is, I cannot erase it. Ah. And then it's OK. Oh, I still have a, quite a bit to do. So I'm not so sure if I should. Yeah, I think I should do at least an idea for the proof of lemma 1. Because even though it's, it's quite straightforward, uh, it is instructive proof of lemma 1. And you apologize, but I just do it for L0 equal del square. So, let us compute because uh, del square x k z i. I'm not sure to what extent you want to see the details, but I will abbreviate a little bit, I think. You take Leibniz rule z i plus, <coughs> how do I want to write it? i x k z i minus 1 times, now of course I forgot here, we take, the, we have to multiply with the inner derivative of z, which is x minus 1. So we get del of uh, xk minus 1 times kzi plus i zi minus 1. Now if we continue, we, again, we apply product rule, k minus 1 xk minus 2 times kzi plus izi minus 1 plus, and now xk minus 1, we have to derive all this, which is k times izi minus 1 x minus 1 plus i i minus 1 
z i minus 2, and again, x minus 1. Don't forget the inner derivative of z. Now you can factor x to the k minus 1 from everything. And we are left with, I just copy, k minus 1, k z i plus i z i minus 1 plus k i z i minus 1, where am I? Plus i i minus 1 z i minus 2. And this will be x k minus 2. So here we see k minus 1 times k, which is k falling factorial 2 z i plus then we see somewhere 2k minus 1. I write it down. 2k minus 1, i, z, i minus 1. This is the usual derivative. But this one here is k2 prime. That's why I mixed it up before. Plus 1 half times 2. 2 is the derivative of now k falling factorial twice, i 2 falling factorial, z i minus 2. So you get precisely what was claimed, k 2 z i plus k 2 prime i. So this uh, you could write this as dz z i plus 1 half k to second derivative, and then d square z of z to the i. OK. So when I realize, I mean, of course, this is implicit in the classical work. But when you do the first time this computation, you are really happy. At the end, you go, oh, it works precisely as you want. Now, the general case is uh, more complicated, you have to work a little bit. So I will just give you the ingredients. You do induction by the number of, uh, of the order of derivation. So the general case, you may try the j equals 3 del j of x, k, z, i. Now, you do this by induction on j. Apply induction on j. So you split this again, del j equals del, uh, del j minus 1. And here, you apply your formula. But then you need more. And the identities, which are not completely obvious, but afterwards, you will easily see that they are correct about the falling, about falling factorials. And that's similar to binomial formulas. It goes as follows. If you take tj falling factorial plus tj falling factorial prime, and you multiply with t minus j. So j is an integer. t is a variable. Then you get t falling factorial j plus 1 derived once. Now, you can iterate this. I just give you the general formula. 1 over L factorial T falling factorial of J derived L times. I have never seen this formula, but it certainly exists in some combinatorial book. If you find it, please let me know. L plus 1 T J falling factorial and you derive L plus 1 times, 
and you multiply again this t minus j, then you get 1 over L plus 1 factorial. You go 1 degree higher, and you derive also L plus 1 times. So this is a general formula for any L, any j. Have you seen this formula already? So of course, it, it should appear in the combinatorics books. But uh, yeah. So this is easy to prove, of course. You just uh, compute it or do induction. And when you use this one and the induction about over j, you get the lemma. Yeah. From all this, all this, lemma 1 follows. So you need a little bit of combinatorial identities, and then you are done. So I have a little bit of time left. That's very good. So let us now determine the image of an Euler operator on this extended, on this extended function space. So proposition. Now, I know already what I have to do, but uh, it was not clear a priori. Proposition. So let E in O del be an Euler operator. Zero, as usual, rho in omega a maximal local exponent. I don't re local maximal with respect to z of multiplicity m rho equals m. One, I don't care how much it is. Let E act on. And now we get, we define a new function space which is smaller than the one before. We take x rho, O, think of O a formal power series, but you can also take convergent one. And now we take polynomials in Z, but of degree less than m. Polynomials in z of degree less than m. This will be our object of desire. Then E underline applied to f is x times f. So it has a very nice shape. It is just x rho plus 1 O Z less than M. So that's precisely the same situation as we had before, multiplication by X. And again, as we already observed, if E is the initial form of an arbitrary operator, the tail of this arbitrary operator will automatically map F into XF. So we have precisely the condition we want. That's precisely what we want. To apply the argument of the normal form theorem. So let me prove this. And then, yes. Of course, it's, it's kind of straightforward, but I want to do it with some detail to convince you that one really has to take care. Let us do first this inclusion, which is, of course, the easy one. So use lemma 1. Lemma 1. And it tells you if 
i is less than m, then i falling factorial with respect to l, which is i times i minus 1, i minus l plus 1, will be 0 for l at least i plus 1. In particular, for l larger than or equal to m. Okay. Therefore, now everything has to, to match together. Yeah, there are many adjustments, for instance, choosing this less than m is crucial. Yeah? So therefore, E applied underline to x k z i will stop. This will stop at the m minus first derivative. So we get x k, I abbreviate a little bit, chi k, same story as before, z i plus chi prime k i z i minus 1. And this goes, but now it only goes up to 1 over m minus 1 factorial m minus first derivative of chi applied to k i m minus 1 falling factorial z i minus m plus 1. Finished. No higher exponents. And then you see that all these, when you take k equals rho, as rho has multiplicity m, all these vanish, and you get e x rho z i is 0 for all i less than m. So if you now multiply with higher order, with higher degree in x, you get precisely this inclusion. Yeah? Nothing in f minus xf. So this is this inclusion, E underline f subset xf. OK. The monomials x rho z i goes to 0, and x rho plus 1 z i goes to something, which I don't care. So here, I did not use that rho is maximal. And my pen is fading out. So let me try this one. So maybe this was going a little bit fast, but I said it in words. So maybe you think a little bit, less, but it's immediate. So the opposite inclusion uses that rho is maximal. E underline f contains xf. So here you have to work a little bit. We have to show that x rho plus k z i lies in the image in E underline f for all k at least 1, all i less than m. OK. So this is, again, by induction on i. First case, i is 0. i is 0, we have no logarithm. Then I can indicate directly the, the image, the pre-image. We take x rho plus k. Now there is no z, so this is just e x rho plus k. But this is chi of rho plus k, x rho plus k. And this here is non-zero because rho is maximal. So this is a pre-image. This x rho plus k is an image of x rho plus k. <coughs> so we get x rho plus k in E f 
for all k at least 1. Now, life is not as simple as it looks like. When you take now larger eyes, you have to apply induction because the image is no longer a monomial. If you take now E underline applied to x rho plus k z i, k again at least 1, then you have to split, split this as before. You get E underline x. Sorry, you get E alone. Please distinguish this. Just E alone means I just apply it to x, and I ignore that I by our formula. So this is now lemma 2. Plus, and you get something which I write you down, even though it's complicated. j equals 1 up to n, 1 over j factorial. j is derivative of l. j is derivative of z to z of x rho plus k z i. And this will be of the form. Now, the first sum end will give you again chi rho plus k z uh, x rho plus k z i. Yeah. Here we don't have underlined, so z remains. And then here, j goes from 1 to n. So as you take the derivative with respect to z, you get a polynomial in z of degree less than i. Polynomial in z of degree less than i. So now by induction on i, you know already that this here is in the image. In E underline of f by induction. And we are done, because this is non zero. We get again this one. OK. So that's, I think that's quite elegant, but a little bit tricky. And you really, really use the two lemmata we have done at the beginning. And with this, we have now everything to formulate the normal form theorem and the description of the solutions in the case of multiplicity 2 or larger. The theorem this is NFT maximal local exponent, m rho arbitrary. So we get, we have L again in O del as before, order of L equals n as everything as usual, L0 initial form. But now we take F our larger space as before, x rho, so rho local exponent. We take O, and now we, have, we allow logarithms up to degree m minus 1. And then there exists u from f to f as before, an isomorphism. And according to regular singularity, not it works on the convergence series or, it, or on the formal ones with L composed with U inverse equal L0. So again, convergence, the same proof. Convergence requires regular singularity. And the corollary is, now this one, this pen is also fading out. So, let me try with the last one. Now we get <coughs> a whole set of solutions. Uh, solutions. Uh, problem. 
u inverse x rho log x to the power i, i less than m. And this will now be of the form x rho log x i times h i of x and h i holomorphic, again, for regular singularity. My time is, oh, oh no, I still have a little bit of time. So the, the hard part to extend our theorem from last time to this case is what we did in the lemmata. Okay? So the proof is the same as before. Proof E L zero of F is X F and T of F lies in X F. Okay. But I don't want to leave you without uh, the program for next day. Now, what happens if rho is not maximal? Where, why is there a problem? What happens if rho is not maximal? Something should go wrong, and it does. And I give you the example. And you can think about it, or I ask you to think about it until next time, because this will give you a better feeling. Very simple. You take Euler operator E, x squared del minus x del chi of t is t times t minus 2, rho equals 2, sigma equals 0. And now you see sigma is not maximal. Sigma not maximal with respect to z, uh, with respect to yeah, z. And uh, <coughs> now both have multiplicity one m rho equals m sigma equals 1. So your candidate, you will have no logarithms a priori. No? I still have to raise here. Right. <clears throat> so your, your solutions of the Euler equation, they are simple. No? So E of 1 is 0, and e of x squared is 0. So want to take our function space equal to o plus o x squared, which is just o. Multiplicity 1, you don't need a logarithm. And you just take, so this is O x sigma plus x rho O. So what is the image? If you now apply E to F. Sorry, um, shouldn't the operator be x squared? L squared minus x squared? Thank you very much. Yes, of course. Very attentive. Now, if you apply this here, what do you get? So you apply E to the formal power series ring or convergent. So x0 will go to 0, so of O. <coughs> So you don't get the constant, but you get c times x. Yeah, you just apply it. If you apply e to x, you get x back. You see it? OK. If you apply x square, if you apply e to x square, so here, so this is just e of x. Plus, now let us look at e x square. 
But e x squared as 2 is the root, this is 0, plus c x cubed. And then you get everything, so plus, actually, you could write here O. O x cubed. From this one on, you get everything. But you see, let me write it again, Cx plus the direct sum, O x cubed, with a gap at x squared. So this one is strictly contained in x times f. The row, the row which is 2, produces this gap here. So your theorem does not apply. Hence, argument of NFT does not, does not apply. We are stuck. We are stuck, at least for today. So next week, I will show you that this is only today. And the idea is invent a new function space, f. And I think it would be much more exciting if you try to guess the function space at least in this example, yeah? you need an enlargement, which again works. Okay. That's all for today. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, evening, morning, and so on. And I hope to see you next week. I will put the notes on, and the exercises on the website probably tomorrow afternoon or maybe on Thursday. Okay. Thank you for listening, and have a wonderful time. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.